Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth Sheely. I am the research division chief here at CARB. Um, and I wanted to welcome you and thank you for coming today. I have a few things that I have to say about the safety of the room and where you can go uh, for the bathrooms and snacks and all that. So if there is a fire alarm or anything, we will have to evacuate and go down the stairs. And then you go across the street to the park across the street. Um, the bathrooms are out this door and over past that wonderful glass statue over there and off to the corner. Um, if the, there is a cafe downstairs, um, if it's still open, I think it closed. Um, and with that, I just want to, um, to thank you. And I also want, I am excited to hear the, this presentation by Dr. Brian McDonald. He has quite an impressive background. I'm looking to make sure I get everything in here. So a PhD in environmental engineering and a master's in public policy from UC Berkeley. Um, and is currently a research scientist at the Cooperative Institute of Research in environmental studies at University of Colorado and at NOAA Earth System Research Lab. So he's here to discuss his work on volatile organic compounds, <coughs> excuse me, and has, that has highlighted the potential importance of consumer products um, in that area. So I will hand it over to you and we're excited to hear more. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me here? So before I get into my talk, I just want to acknowledge that this is a big collaborative effort involving a lot of my colleagues in the Chemical Sciences Division at the NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory and University of Colorado, as well as some collaborators outside. Um, and this work was largely funded by a uh, innovative research proposal that was funded by the University of Colorado, as well as the NOAA Cooperative Institute Agreement between the university and NOAA. So, I want to start with a question that was posed in this large field campaign that occurred in Los Angeles in 2010, the California Nexus study. That was a study that NOAA was a part of, uh, and the idea was to better understand the sources of air pollutants as well as greenhouse gases that could, could contribute to climate. Uh, but one of the questions posed in that study was, if you look at the diurnal pattern of, second, of organic aerosol, in the LA basin, you notice that you have this uh, peak that's in the middle of the day. And there were some groups that did some carbon-14 analysis that were able to differentiate, well, how much of this is from non-fossil or natural sources versus fossil sources up here. And so you can notice that this big peak in the middle day, uh, it's associated with atmospheric processing in the air and that it's of fossil origin. So people in the scientific community were asking, what is this source of fossil secondary organic aerosol here? And one of the hypotheses was that it was mainly coming from gasoline emissions. Another hypothesis was that it was dominated from diesel sources. And actually there was a third hypothesis that came out of Caltech, which said either we don't know how SOA is formed, which is also possible, or, and, and so we may be underestimating the yields substantially, or there could be other sources contributing to that, that fossil SOA. So this is an analysis that my colleague Carson Warnicke did at, uh, at, at NOAA. So what he did here was look at five decades of measurements of VOCs in the Los Angeles basin. This is one of the, Los Angeles is one of the cities where you do have a long historical record that you can keep track of how things have changed. And this is on a logarithmic scale. And what he noticed is CO concentrations are right here. So uh, orders of magnitude decreases in carbon monoxide concentrations. And in the paper and in, people, in studies where people have studied tailpipe exhaust from vehicles, they've been able to attribute this rapid decrease in carbon monoxide to uh, improve three-way catalytic converters. And what Karsten also noticed is that a lot of the VOCs, and a lot of these VOCs that have been measured over a long time period are from, uh, can be uh, from gasoline or the exhaust of gasoline engines. So things like benzene, toluene, order of magnitude decreases along with CO, as well as light alkenes that come out of the combustion side as well. So the point is rapid decreases in the emissions from tailpipe exhaust of motor vehicles. 
So before our paper came out, there was a paper that was published in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, in Europe. So this group in Innsbruck, Austria, had these eddy covariance flux tower measurements. And what they noticed was half of the emissions that they were seeing in, in Innsbruck, Austria, were of an oxygenated nature. And so they suggested that this potentially could be a source. This probably wasn't just from uh, mobile sources, but could be from solvents. And they also highlighted cooking as a potential source of oxygenated VOCs. And then we had our study that came out for Los Angeles, where we looked at ambient measurements that were collected in the California Nexus study and sort of saw that uh, the distribution appeared to be at this tipping point where uh, half of the emissions were coming from the energy-related sources on the right side here. So this is gasoline exhaust, evaporated gasoline, diesel exhaust, as well as uh, potential light alkanes that could come from the natural gas distribution system. And then this left side are these volatile chemical products that we, we suggested are things like coatings, inks, adhesives, personal care products, cleaning agents. So it's a wide range. There's many, many different products that, that add up to here. And then the last thing I just want to point out is that uh, uh, a group out of Yale also looked at trends of VOCs over time. And I think they looked at the inventories that are reported from the California Air Resources Board for this. And so the black ones are VOC emissions that are associated with mobile sources. And the green one uh, is, it would be non-energy sources. So this wouldn't just be chemical product emissions. Uh, there's, they also consider asphalt paving in there. But the bottom line is uh, even in the, the, the regulatory in the inventories, there is some transition away from, uh, because the on-road part here has been decreasing, so there is some transition going on to, to other non-energy related sources. And this group also looked at the SOA formation potential as well as the, the ozone formation potential over time. So the last thing I just want to step back, right, because when you're thinking about air pollution, there's no one source that's really contributing to this, right? You need both nitrogen oxides along with the volatile organic compounds to lead to these uh, products in the atmosphere, including uh, ozone as well as fine particulate matter. And the nitrogen oxides are still mainly coming from the combustion sources, right? So mobile sources are still the main source of, of NOx in cities. Uh, and you still, uh, less so in the western US where it's more arid, but on the eastern US you have a lot of biogenic vegetation, so those are also an important source of VOCs. But in this talk, I'm gonna mainly focus on the anthropogenic VOCs, not because I don't think these other components are important. I mean, nox nitrogen oxides are an important component to the formation of ozone and PM 2.5. And the natural vegetation on the eastern US is also an important source of these. But I'm going to focus on the anthropogenic VOCs just because it's a potentially uncertain source uh, that, that uh, hopefully we can try to better characterize with some of the work that we've, we've done here. So in this talk, I'm going to cover three objectives. Uh, I'd like to talk about some follow-up work we've done in Los Angeles, uh, both in Boulder, Colorado, and New York City. Uh, so first, I'll talk about some chemical tracers we can use to be able to identify whether these chemical product emissions are getting into the ambient air. Second, I'll talk about efforts that we've done to try to uh, calculate the, the balance of VOC emissions in New York City, much like we did for Los Angeles. And then lastly, I will talk about some, some preliminary work where we're looking at more uh, highly reactive species that could be emitted. So the, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, this molecule d 5 siloxane So if you look at the CARB inventory, you notice that it primarily shows up in the personal care product sector. And so it's an interesting molecule because it's a, it's a fairly large molecule, 370 grams per, per mole. Uh, it's got five silicon, five oxygen, so it's a fairly unique molecule that uh, our newer instrumentation is able to detect. And there's been studies that sort of point out that uh, the use is probably maybe 70% in antiperspirants and 20% in hair care products. 
so we're gonna explore whether we can use this molecule to get a better understanding of personal care product emissions. The other thing about this molecule, so this is work by Alan Goldstein's group at UC Berkeley where they measured an engineering classroom. And one of the things that was surprising to them when they measured the abundance of VOCs in the classroom was that the largest VOC that they measured was the siloxanes category. And so people have done back of the envelope calculations to estimate that uh, uh, people maybe emit somewhere between 100 to 700 milligrams per person per day. So I wanna point out that my colleague, Matt Coggin, who makes the measurements of, with this proton transfer reaction time of flight mass spectrometer, so this is one of the advanced spectrometers we have in our lab. He had put our instrumentation on our lab in Boulder. So our, our lab is south of, uh, of sort of, this is the University of Colorado right here. This is the downtown area of Boulder. And so our lab is somewhat situated downwind. And what Matt was trying to look for was actually wintertime biomass burning emissions. He wasn't looking for any uh, chemical product uh, or, or mobile source type of emissions. He was mainly interested in looking at a molecule furfural, which is emitted from, from uh, wood smoke. Uh, but what he noticed was with our proton transfer reaction time of flight mass spectrometer, so this is an instrument that can measure hundreds of VOCs at high time resolution. And it is sensitive to the, this uh, D5 siloxane compound. So this instrument is able to pick up this molecule at high confidence and high time resolution. And so when Matt started looking at the data, on the left is the concent diurnal concentrations of D5 siloxane in blue. And on right is the diurnal concentration of benzene uh, in red. And in general, there seemed to be this uh, sim similar diurnal pattern uh, to these two compounds, uh, which he was trying to figure out, well, what does this mean? Could this be from coming from mobile sources? Uh, since we know that benzene is still mainly coming from gasoline. And so he looked at the ratios of D5 relative to benzene and noticed that there is D5 is enhanced relative to benzene in the early morning and sort of decays across the day. He also did some mobile van measurements around the city of Boulder just to make sure that our ground site wasn't uh, unrepresentative and they were pretty consistent with each other. And so what you can do then is, if you know what the uh, uh, benzene emissions, so if we generally have some understanding of what the emissions from motor vehicles are. And so benzene is still mainly coming from gasoline, and it has this dual peak, right, associated with morning and evening commute. And so we can take those ratios of D5 relative to benzene to understand, to get back of the envelope estimate of what D5 siloxane emissions could be. And what was, there were two things that were interesting in this analysis. One is that the peak of the D5 siloxane emissions in the morning were in the morning and sort of decayed across the day. And this is actually somewhat consistent with the, the engineering classroom study by Alan Goldstein at UC Berkeley, where they noticed that when they measured the classroom for the morning classes, they measured more D5 siloxanes uh, off of the students. Whereas uh, later in the day, those, those emissions uh, decayed. They didn't see as much siloxanes in the afternoon classes. And the second thing that was interesting to Matt was that the concentrations in the morning of D5 siloxane were somewhat comparable to the emissions from, from benzene. So Matt, just to be, be safe, wanted to make sure that the D5 siloxane was coming from, um, 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 not from the vehicle. So he designed an experiment where he flushed a car. So he put our instrument on to the, the measure the cabin air of the vehicle. He flushed it with ambient air and then had four of our coworkers come into the car and sort of see how the concentrations of slox lanes varied in the car. And so here are the four periods uh, where, where people came into the car. And you can see that the siloxanes really increase for two of the occupants. One of the occupants uh, doesn't use personal care products. <laughs> and one of the occupants, uh, it's not in everything, so it's not in all, all personal care products. So their names will remain nameless. <laughs> but the point is, is that you can see emissions of VOCs not just from the tailpipe of the car, 
but also from the occupant in the car. Much like in the indoor environment, people measure VOCs, uh, like in the engineering classroom. So one thing we've done since, since Boulder and, and, and with our instrument is, I'll talk about next some of the work we did in New York City, but we did keep our instrumentation on all the way back from New York to Boulder. And so in the process, we were able to sample air masses from several cities. So we, we have measurements now in New York City, Chicago, Denver, and Pittsburgh. Uh, this instrument is a little newer. So during the California Nexus study, it was kind of uh, a little bit before people were really using this instrument. So we don't have these measurements in Los Angeles yet. Um, but this is the ratio of D5 siloxane relative to benzene. Uh, so again, D5 siloxane we think is potentially a marker for personal care products. Benzene is a marker for, for vehicles. Uh, benzene is a carcinogen, so largely benzene, I assume, has been taken out of a lot of the chemical products. So we think that this gives us a nice ratio of potentially vehicles relative to personal care product emissions. And what my colleague Girgos Gatzelis uh, noticed is this, is is that when he plots this D5 to benzene ratio, that appears to have a population density relationship. So what's going on here is that as cities get more dense, people on average drive less per capita, right? New York City has one of the most utilized mass transit city, uh, uh, mass transit systems in the country. And I'll show later that it turns out that people's personal care product use and emissions tend to be relatively similar across these areas. So that may be why we see this higher ratio in the more dense areas. And so Girgos is looking at more compounds. Uh, we probably have characterized uh, D5 siloxane uh, uh, the best in our instrument to this point. But we're also trying to see with this advanced mass spectrometry instrument whether we can pick up more markers that may be able to tell us more specificity of what types of sources are contributing in VOC emissions to the atmosphere. Because one of the questions is, well, there's a lot of different categories that can, can be contributing here. Which ones are the, the more key ones? So we're looking at compounds like D4-siloxane, P-dichlorobenzene, terpenes. Uh, there's a compound perichlorobenzotrifluoride, as well as uh, texanol. And so we're in the process of determining whether we can use these these uh, measurements that we have are in our instrumentation to get a better understanding of the sources. So just in summary, uh, to this point, we think that D5 siloxane is potentially a useful uh, marker for, for personal care product emissions. Uh, its temporal pattern is consistent with the idea that this could be from personal care products where the emissions peak in the morning and then as exponentially decay across the day. And we've noticed this population density relationship between D5 siloxane to benzene, suggesting that where you have more people, you may have more of these sources. Uh, and then lastly, we're in the process of trying to identify other tracers to be able to estimate different emission sources. So Boulder is nice, but Boulder is also not New York City in terms of size. Uh, it turns out uh, this was kind of interesting is that the size of Boulder landwise is about 60 kilometers squared, and Manhattan is also about 60 kilometers squared. And the only difference between the two cities is that you have way more people that, that live in Manhattan. So 1.6 million versus 100,000 people in Boulder. And hopefully Boulder can stay around 100,000 people. Um, and so, what uh, we did last, we, we made some measurements in New York City, both in the winter time and in the summer. So we were in New York about a few weeks in March and a few weeks in July. And so the idea of going in the winter time is that we wanted to get an understanding of the anthropogenic sources of VOCs. So in the winter time, the bio, and biogenic activity is lower. Um, and so we wanted to go uh, when there was to when there was lower biogenic activity. And the reason we wanted to go back in the summertime is because we're also interested in the chemistry. So uh, in the summertime, uh, there's faster photochemistry uh, than, than in the wintertime. And so what we did was we brought this proton transfer reaction time of flight mass spectrometer that we had been using to measure the air in Boulder, but to New York City. 
We also brought with us our integrated whole air samplers, which are a complementary VOC measurement to the PTR TOF MS, so we can get a wider range of VOCs across these two instruments. We also brought uh, trace gas measurements, including carbon monoxide, CO2, methane, and N2O. And we operated our instruments in two modes. We put our instruments on our mobile laboratory and had it driving around New York City. And we also had our, our instrumentation operated as a ground site at the City College of New York. City College of New York is located in Harlem in Upper Manhattan. And the idea here is we wanted to be closer to where the people were. So this is the population density of New York and clearly Manhattan is where, where most of the, or the highest concentration of people are. And again, I want to acknowledge my colleagues at NOAA uh, who really did these experiments here. I'm actually in the modeling group, but I really relied on the, the really nice work by our experimental colleagues who ran this instrumentation uh, on the dime. And it's, it is challenging to measure in an urban environment, especially in a mobile laboratory. There's lots of potholes, and sometimes instruments don't like the, the potholes. But they got it to, they fixed it. <laughs> So we could do those measurements. Um, just to give you a sense of what it looked like in the wintertime, so we happened to get to New York City right before foreign nor'easters hit the New York area. So on one hand, that was nice from the sense that it, the snow shut off uh, pretty much a lot or all of the, the biogenic activity. But it did make it challenging for the, the experimentalists to set up the instrumentation at the university. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what the, the concentrations, uh, this is of carbon monoxide. So in New York City, you can, in the wintertime, get a lot of peaks over one uh, part per million of carbon monoxide, uh, which just shows that uh, there is a high um, population density there, so there's lots of emission sources around. Uh, when we arrived, again, nor'easters, but we did stay uh, for this sort of build-up period right here uh, at the end, which helped give us a better understanding of the potential sources of, of carbon monoxide as well as volatile organic compounds. So the next thing I just want to talk about is efforts we've done to try and estimate the VOC emissions in a manner very similar to how we did it for Los Angeles, just so can we use the, the methods of you know, the activity sales we reported on our paper and emission factors to get emissions of VOCs? Uh, and then the second thing is just compare it with our atmospheric observations. So this would, and to be able to do that, we want to take meteorology and dilution out of the equation. So we, we estimate ratios of VOCs relative to CO in our emissions inventory, and then I'm going to compare it with the ambient VOC to CO measurements that we made in New York, just to get a sense of how well our emissions inventory can, can predict uh, the ambient concentrations that we measured in New York City. So the first step is in New York was just to look at how much gasoline and diesel fuel do people use in their motor vehicles. So we've got estimates on that, including uh, where cars are driving. Uh, next, we also looked at some of the emissions from mobile sources. This isn't just from motor vehicles, but also from smaller off-road gasoline engines, as well as off-road diesel. So this would be things like construction equipment. Um, we also looked at uh, potential emissions that could occur from the natural gas distribution system. Uh, and also the amount of uh, volatile chemical products people use on average. And so this just puts it in perspective how people, the energy use of, of uh, people in Manhattan in the winter 2018 versus Los Angeles summer 2010. And what you notice is that there's a lot more natural gas fuel use in New York. That should make sense. There's wintertime heating that's going on. Uh, but the other interesting thing is that there's much less uh, gasoline use on average. Again, people are driving on less on average in New York City versus in, in Los Angeles. So the next thing we did was look at the emission factors updated to, to 2018 here. Uh, and so we updated based on recent vehicle tailpipe emission studies that have happened in the, the last few years. 
Uh, a lot of these volatile chemical product emissions are fairly similar to what was in our paper. We did consider some updates to the coating emissions that occur between 2010 and 2018 here. Uh, so we have tried to reflect uh, uh, some of the, the, the regulations over time. And then the one thing to note is in New York, there's also coating regulations as well to, to reduce the, the uh, uh, organic solvent content. So we tried to account for that as well. But you take those emission factors and you multiply it by those activity uh, numbers I showed two slides earlier, and you roughly get uh, maybe 60% of emissions from coming from the, the chemical products in, in, in Manhattan. Uh, actually, the second largest source that we saw was uh, from these off-road gasoline engines. So what you noticed in New York City, there's actually a lot of uh, smaller two-stroke engines that are, are used in, say, food trucks or, or snow blowing equipment. Uh, so there's a lot of people and a lot of smaller engines there. But what was a little surprising to us, if you add up the, this is the tailpipe exhaust from gasoline vehicles. In the wintertime, you don't have much evaporative gasoline emissions, but even if you had summertime evaporative gasoline emissions that were higher, this would be the traditional uh, transportation sources, and they seem to be a relatively small fraction of that VOC uh, chart in, in New York. And just to compare that with, with uh, Los Angeles, maybe this side of the budget, the non-energy side is a little bit larger in New York versus Los Angeles, but it's fairly comparable fraction of that budget. But the next thing we wanted to do was look at the, not just the total VOC emissions, but individual VOCs and see how that compares with our measurements. Because uh, we don't measure total VOCs, we measure individual VOCs in our instrumentation. And so this is just the composition of uh, energy sources on the left side. And one thing we tried to do was, I noticed that the CARB surveys, 2015 survey maybe came out about two weeks ago. So had a chance to try and update our VOC speciation profiles with the 2050 consumer product survey, as well as the 2014 architectural coding survey. So the speciation should be more up to date than when we did our study in, in 20. That's largely coming from the California Air Resources Board. But the key thing to know is that one of the reasons we can uh, distinguish uh, the, the chemical product emission sources from the energy sources on the left is that the, on the right side, you tend to have a lot more oxygenated compounds. So these are things like alcohols, ketones, esters uh, that we're able to measure now. So before I start comparing with the ambient observations, you know, one of the uncertainties will be, well, how well do we know carbon monoxide emissions? So we have a, a inventory we've developed for carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is still mainly coming from the mobile source sector. Uh, and just to get a check on it, there was actually a flight over, uh, some flights over the New York City region in 2015 by this aircraft campaign that was led by the uh, uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. And so in general, uh, when we compare our inventory with estimates of what CO emissions are derived from this aircraft, generally they're in reasonable agreement with each other. So we don't think there's too much uncertainty of our estimate in CO emissions. So right here I'm showing measurements of D5 siloxane on the y-axis and on the x-axis I'm showing uh, measurements that we made of carbon monoxide. And these are ambient ratios that, that we measured. And in, in blue are the D5 to CO concentrations that we measured in the wintertime and red is the D5 to CO concentrations we measured in the summertime. And in general, these ratios are fairly similar to each other. And this was a little bit surprising to us because our expectation was these are evaporative sources of emissions. We know from gasoline, right, that as temperatures get hotter, there's more, more emissions of, of uh, evaporative gasoline. But in this case, we see no seasonality in these emission sources. And so what we're thinking is going on here is that if a lot of these sources are actually used in the indoor environment, actually the temperature difference between seasons, between winter and summer is not too large. And I can tell you in our uh, apartment in, in the wintertime that it was, a lot of these are older buildings in New York's and they were just blasted with, with heating. So it did feel like summertime 
in, in winter in New York. So we think that's why you see more of a consistent source uh, year round. And so if we know what the CO emissions are in, in, in New York and Manhattan, we have rough idea of the population. We can back out an emission factor, so roughly 300, 330 milligrams per person per day. That's in that range of 100 to 700 milligrams per person per day that people have reported elsewhere in the literature. And actually, it is somewhat consistent with the, the emissions that we noticed in, in Los Angeles. At the time, we didn't have a D5 measurement in ambient air, but we could still estimate it from our, our emissions inputs. So on average, pretty similar emissions per person in two different cities of the country. But the D5 is just one, one molecule. We, across our two instruments, so with our, uh, uh, air, our whole air samplers that we had analyzed by gas chromatography mass spectrometry, as well as our uh, PTR TOF MS that was uh, measuring online in New York City, we get roughly uh, 30 plus VOCs between these two instruments. And just to emphasize, these are complementary to each other. The PTR TOF is really good at measuring oxygenated compounds, but may be missing things like alkanes, cycloalkanes, alkenes here. Uh, but there is some overlap in aromatics and terpenes that we can measure across the two. But you really need both instruments if you want to get a more complete picture of, of the VOCs uh, in these, these urban air masses. So on the x-axis are what we observed in ambient air, VOC to CO ratios. On the y-axis are VOC to CO ratios from our emissions if we only could consider fossil fuel sources. And this is on a logarithmic scale. So uh, notice here, so ethanol is right here, acetone, MEK. So the ambient concentrations are five times higher in or more in New York City air than you can predict by the amount of ethanine, ethanol, Per, per se, in uh, gasoline fuel. So ethanol is 10% of gasoline by mass. And when we put in those emissions from those pie charts earlier for the volatile chemical products, much like in Los Angeles, we start getting better agreement with the, the ambient observations. And so here we underpredict the mass from the fossil fuel sources by 73% and we start getting closer to, to the measurements here. So the, the bottom line is, uh, much like in Los Angeles, we see uh, similar fractions of this distribution of VOC sources between uh, the, the energy side of the equation and the non-energy side of the equation. And uh, you need to put these emissions at about these levels to be able to explain the variability in those VOC species that we're measuring, uh, 30 plus species. Uh, to, and, and the one thing I'll point out is one thing that is different with this data set in New York City than, than what we had in Los Angeles is with the PTR TOF MS, we start getting more species that, that we weren't able to measure before. Things like D4 siloxane, D5 siloxane, perichlorobenzotrifluoride, and dichlorobenzene, which we're exploring to whether these could be additional markers for, for chemical product emissions. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, we've been looking at not just uh, all VOCs, but uh, some of the more reactive VOCs. And so a potential source of terpenes to the atmosphere could be coming from uh, uh, the use of, of uh, consumer products. So things like uh, fragrances often have terpenes that are in them, as well as terpene-based cleaners. Uh, and so this is just some uh, estimated fluxes of, of terpenes. So these were measurements that NOAA had done in an earlier campaign over the southeastern US. You get roughly 30 moles of carbon per kilometer squared per hour during the daytime over a dense forest. Uh, we did some back of the envelope calculations of what uh, terpene emissions could be from the use of chemical products. Uh, uh, so maybe you might get uh, 15 moles of carbon per kilometer square per hour, but we were trying to get a sense of in Manhattan, what could the flux of terpenes be there? And could it be uh, on par with uh, potential biogenic sources? Because uh, there is vegetation out in the Eastern US. So before I get to the measurement of terpenes, I'm showing here measurements of are measurements of D5 siloxane. So these are, again, uh, 
uh, measurements that we think are potential marker for personal care product emissions. Uh, what we did with our mobile laboratory is we drove from New Jersey through Manhattan uh, out to Long Island to try to get the urban spatial gradient from high population density to a more, uh, it's not quite rural over here, but as rural as we can with, the, with our drives. And so in yellow are our concentrations of D5 that are higher, uh, and in red are lower concentrations. And this black bars at the top just represent D5 concentrations that we're measuring with our mobile laboratory, bin by longitude. And one thing we noticed was we looked at our drive track and estimated what is the population density as we go around uh, this region. And what we noticed is that there's a pretty strong relationship between the D5 concentration that we're measuring with our mobile laboratory and with the, the population density as we're driving around. So where there's more people, you might expect there to be more D5 siloxane emissions and concentrations. And that's what is reflected in this, this graph right here. But the other thing we looked at, so again, this is winter time, uh, snow on the ground, not much biogenic activity going on. And we noticed that the terpenes that we were measuring with our mobile laboratory also exhibited some population density relationship. Not as strong, because there is some uh, terpene emissions associated with pine trees on the outside of the city. But it seemed like there was this relationship between where people were and where the terpene concentrations were. The other thing we could look at with our whole air sampler, uh, uh, canister samples was not just the total mass of terpenes, but also the speciation of those terpenes. So what terpenes are being emitted? And so what's interesting is that the green shows alpha and beta pinene. So these are, you know, think of the pine smell. Uh, these are mainly coming from, from vegetation. And on the outside of the city, you see a lot of pinenes. But in the middle of the city, you see the strong enhancement in limonene. So what my colleagues did was, well, look at the terpene speciation that we measure in Manhattan. So you see a lot of limonene here. And notice, looked at the indoor air quality literature where they noticed that there is quite a bit of limonene there as well, right? And then the, the dominance of pinenes on the outside of the city were fairly consistent with the idea of uh, emissions of terpenes from pitch pines. So this is uh, from um, um, literature showing what the terpene speci speciation is of, of pine trees. So our measurements are pretty consistent with that natural source outside. But what is interesting is if you, we, this is the same drive track, but now in the summertime. So the one thing that's different here is we now don't see a population density relationship in that uh, terpene concentration. Now there is biogenic activity that is going on outside the city. So there are terpene emissions happening in the summertime. But the concentrations inside the city are also comparable with that, that outside concentration. And what's also furthermore is if you look at that terpene speciation in the middle of Manhattan, it's still almost exactly identical to that terpene speciation in the wintertime. So limonene is still the dominant terpene. If there were more biogenic sources of terpenes in the, the summertime, you'd expect that pinene or green fraction to be larger in proportion than in winter. That's not what we see here. So we've looked a little bit more closely at this to make sure that what we're seeing here is correct. And one way we've done that is do chemical transport modeling with uh, biogenic emissions into our model. Uh, and what we notice, and so here we don't have any anthropogenic uh, terpene emissions in our model. But what we notice is that uh, this is our drive track in black. This is the observations that our mobile laboratory measured. When we model the concentrations of terpenes from the biogenic sources, there's almost no bio, or biogenic terpenes that make it into New York City, right? So what's going on here is that the terpenes are very reactive, that by the time they, they don't quite make it to New York City because they've already racked it away. So this difference that we see between the observations in our model uh, potentially could be coming from anthropogenic sources. So overall, we think we see evidence for human sources of terpenes because they're there in the winter, uh, even though there's no or not much biogenic activity. Uh, it's well correlated with spatial patterns of D5 siloxane, 
Uh, and we see terpene speciations that are different in the city versus outside. Uh, and we're doing more calculations to try and get a better estimate of what that flux could be, but it seems to be comparable to the, the surrounding forest. So the last thing I just want to touch on is one of the questions we get um, uh, sometimes is why, why haven't you discussed trends of these emission sources? Because as an air quality management community, right, it's not like uh, chemical product emissions, consumer product emissions, coatings haven't been regulated. I mean, they've been regulated for their potential to form, form ozone as well as other things. Uh, and so one of the challenges is if you just look at a compound, something like acetone, which if you look at the emission inventories, it looks like its main source is related to coating related products. And if you look at the ambient record of acetone in, in LA, it has this increasing period and then sort of stabling period, right? But this doesn't mean that coating emissions have gone up and stabilized, right? We know that the, the coatings have been reformulated to reduce VOCs. And one of the ways we know that is we've, uh, in our laboratory, taken some samples of coating products, put it into our PTR TOF MS, and on the left side is the mass spectra of a solvent borne water stain, and on the right side is of a low VOC paint. And this is, on, this is the signal of the PTR TOF MS. So this somewhat scales with the abundance of VOCs in there. And it's pretty clear there's a lot of VOCs in the solvent form formulations, but the low VOC paints actually have low VOCs in there, right? So as there's a switch from solvent to waterborne formulations, a lot of product, product coating related products are between these two ranges. So as you switch here, you might expect the VOCs to come down. And so one of the things we've been looking at is can we pick out atmospheric markers to be able to get a better understanding of these trends, in this case for coatings, but we'll look for other tracers that we can use for the other types of consumer products. And so acetone is something you do find that, that we have found in both the solvent and waterborne formulations so that we do have long-term measurements of acetone that we could try to use as a constraint on that, emission, or that compound. But we're also noticing some tracers that we potentially can use, things like perichlorobenzotrifluoride that we notice in the solvent borne formulations. And we're trying to see if we can measure this compound texanol to potentially trace uh, trends in the, the waterborne or, or, or lower VOC formulations. And this just reflects one of the reasons we're looking at PCBTF and also texanol is if you look at the CARB surveys, these are uh, quite important ingredients now in the coding survey, so roughly 10% of the total, right? So uh, if they're coding emissions, then we should be able to measure this in the atmosphere. Uh, and then the other thing is these trend lines here, re which reflect a big challenge, right? Because the unlike for, I mean, there have been efforts to reformulate gasoline uh, to remove uh, aromatics, but the reformulation of chemical products has been much more drastic. So for us to be able to use these atmospheric observations to, to get a better understanding of these emission trends, we not only need to know the, the emissions over time, but also how the formulations change over time. And that potentially is where uh, the data that the California Air Resources Board could be useful as a, as a constraint on that. But the last thing I just want to point out is why I'm hopeful that we'll be able to use these markers to be able to get a better understanding of what emissions are for, for different sectors. This is an example of our measurements of perichlorobenzotrifluoride. And we do notice we are able to measure enhancements in the city. So this might be able a way for us to tell how much solvent bomb, uh, emissions might be there. Uh, and we're looking at Texanol to see if we can also get a sense of what the waterborne formulations might be. And potentially, if we have confidence in these measurements, we could probably even tell, if we were confident in the, the formulations, we could say how much waterborne paints are people using versus how much solvent borne are with our instrumentation. So just some concluding remarks. We, we see a lot of similarities between New York and Los Angeles. Uh, as far as the emissions of these volatile chem chemical products. Uh, we see some evidence for human sources of terpenes that may be differentiable from the, the biogenic sources. 
And we think with the advancements in instrumentation in the last decade that we may be able to pick up more species and get more chemical specificity of the different sources, which will hopefully lead to improvements and, and improved confidence in the, the emission inventories that are used in our models. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. Open the floor for our questions. Yeah, we have some time for questions and uh, from the audience, also the people who listen in. Thanks for your talk, I really appreciate it. Um, I was curious, because I tend to think of uh, siloxanes and limonene as in uh, being in down the drain products. Did you drive by any wastewater treatment plants to kind of see what the emissions were there? Yeah, so I mean, no. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of time in New York to be able to do that. Uh, I will say in the past, when we've done measurements to try to measure tailpipe vehicle or motor vehicles on the road. There was an incident where we measured sort of a waste truck driving by and you did see enhancements of siloxanes from it. So it's possible there could be some that do get transported to landfills. And I've talked with some people who measure, who are more on the water quality side and they've said to me that this pattern of siloxane emissions that peak in the morning, they can also see at wastewater treatment plants that the inflow of effluent uh, ha is enhanced in siloxanes in the morning. So there's definitely uh, siloxanes that go down the drain and we have, to the extent that we can, try to account for that fate and transport, much like how the, the California Air Resources Board and EPA does for their emission inventories. Hey Brian, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering, uh, did you measure formaldehyde? And if yes, how does formaldehyde correlate with uh, siloxane and terpenes? Yeah, so I think our PTR top may be able to measure formaldehyde, but formaldehyde is not necessarily the best measurement for it. So we haven't really tried to explore the formaldehyde component yet. Um, but I will say that during this New York campaign, so we were just one of many investigators. So NASA did fly one of their aircraft over New York City uh, using one of their more high resolutions, uh, advanced imaging that they're able to do, try to replicate what a future geostationary satellite might see with uh, uh, NO2 and formaldehyde columns. So they potentially have useful formaldehyde data to be able to explore that question further. Any other questions? Uh, thanks for the talk, Brian. Um, can you just give us a approximate estimate of some of the ranges of atmospheric lifetimes for these uh, DCPs? Are they really localized in nature? Or? Right, so something like the terpenes are fairly local, right? If the biogenic vegetation outside the city can't get in, then you're talking about lifetimes on the order of 10 to 20 minutes, right, under an hour. But something like siloxane, which is uh, not a very reactive molecule, I mean, if, um, Lifetime is similar to benzene, so you're talking maybe a week there. Uh, and then other compounds, right, can be longer, longer lived. So there's a, there's a wide range of, of that. And I will say one of the molecules that, I mean, we measure in New York City and also in Los Angeles, the biggest molecule turns out actually to be ethanol, which somewhere maybe in the middle of terpenes and there's a wide range of reactivities. 
So Brian, I have a question about like Los Angeles. We consider the terrain uh, topography is like a basin for New York City. Well, I feel like it's not like the elk uh, in that area. It's probably different the topography or something. Yeah, so how so the, to... the interesting thing about New York City is you're right. The air in Los Angeles tends to get more trapped more, right? Because there's mountains around it. But last year in 2018, the Northeast experienced several heat waves. And during a heat wave, you get wind speeds below five meters per second. So, and this can happen for multiple days. Uh, so you can get uh, NO2 levels that are comparable to, to Los Angeles, even though uh, there's not topography around. The, the, the synoptic scale meteorology can just sit and cook over New York City. Any other questions? Um, the uh, attention to D5 siloxane, I think it's um, great and it uh, corroborates some of the findings of the air research top 10 uh, thousand years. But, um, Along the same lines, I would like to um, make sure that um, paying attention mm -hmm. um, I noticed, for example, the slide with the <coughs> was referring to VOC emissions from a, a, an ARB uh, post uh, VOC emissions. emissions. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the, one of the challenges with trying to compare people's different estimates, right, is, I mean, we've had this conversation before. The regulatory definition of a VOC is not the same definition of the atmospheric chemistry community. Right? So reconciling these definitions is an important to try and resolve. Any other I, questions? I, I will say one other thing is also the definitions from different states can also be quite different too. So that presents a challenge for EPA when they try to aggregate 50 different states. Yeah. Right. Uh, any other questions or oh, questions online? If not, let's thank our speaker, Brian, again. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending.